I'm talking, strangely enough, about silence. And silence seems a bit strange to many of us, but we can have a strong silence in our lives, and that strong silence can bring life and not death. It's almost counterintuitive, because as Christians we share our faith with our friends and family, very often we will pray out loud and we'll do a lot of things with communication, but sometimes silence is called for. Ecclesiastes 3 says, there is a time to talk and there is a time to stay silent. How can we know that as people of faith? Where do we get the leading to know such a thing? Well, today I want to look at the experience of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and see if we can pick up some pointers to that. But first of all, I'm going to get a political point off my chest. Am I okay to get a political point off my chest? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, we're not sure. Okay. All right, someone said it out, amen. I wasn't adopted. My mum and dad were my birth parents. I can't say I've been very close to anyone who was adopted, but every now and again something comes up uh, in Irish society and it makes me angry. I'm the first person to thank God for our nation. It's a, I find it's a great place to live. There's so many strong points about the culture here. However, our church motto is real people, real church. That doesn't speak about other churches, that's just speaking about us. And what it means is that we should all be honest. And if something isn't right, we need to call it out. And I think in our culture, something wasn't right. TUSLA is Ireland's Child and Family Agency. I'm not saying they're not doing a great job, nothing like that. But its predecessor organisations, as well as to a degree TUSLA, operating under, I think, an unjust law in Ireland. If someone was adopted and they wanted to know who their birth mother was, they wouldn't tell you. Partly it was the law, and thankfully that law has changed now. But there was also, according to investigations into all of these Irish government organisations, there was a culture of silence. And people who were coming to an end of their lives, were about to die, came begging to know, who was my birth mother? Before I die, I would like to know this. But the culture of silence would say no, even though they had all the information there. And it was a lot more than, um, well, we don't want to embarrass a woman who maybe had a child when she was young, out of marriage. It wasn't that at all. The mothers were long dead. But that culture of silence remained. Now, there was good people there, and it's a mixed picture, and I'm not doing it justice. But praise God, the law was changed. Now you can find out who your birth mother was, and maybe your birth father as well. The point I want to make about this is silence can be very cruel. And when people keep information about who you are, your identity. That can be so cruel. And this is what was happening in Ireland, and quite a number of people went to their graves with a broken heart, just not knowing who they were. Equally, on the other side of it, in Ireland, usually, we don't like silence. And if you've come here from another country, you might be wondering, um, Maybe you've noticed it because there's a thing called the Irish silence and the Irish silence is a very different animal. Now when we started our church in 1996, about two years later, um, we began to see people from all over the world move to court to work, to study, as refugees and so on. And we began to mix with all different cultures. And a lot of the local Christians in the church began to say, well I was with them the other night and they just said nothing. There was just a silence. And when I said to them, you're very quiet, they said, well, I have nothing to say. And they were quite comfortable with that. But the locals were really uncomfortable with it. Because the Irish silence is, you might have nothing to say, but don't you dare sit in silence. Just keep talking about anything at all. <laughs> oh, wasn't it a lovely warm day last Thursday? Oh, my goodness me, sure I thought I'd melt in Patrick Street to 10 degrees. Oh, goodness gracious me. And isn't the price of eggs gone through the roof? 
Oh, they're a lovely pair of shoes. I have a pair like that myself at home. You see, the Irish are one of the best in the world at doing small talk. And it's almost like, I think it goes back to the great Irish famine. It's like, we're not comfortable if people are just sitting in silence. So we fill the empty space with loads of old chat. And very often, if you're in that situation, it's called the Irish silence. But you know what? It's stupid, isn't it? No? It's okay sometimes to say nothing. Michael agrees. Anyone else? Sometimes it's okay. We don't have to fill the silences. It's okay not to say anything. So I want to look today at how Jesus Christ chose to be silent. Some of you will know the scripture. For some of you it's all new. But the Irish silence, forget about it. Let's see what Jesus said. We're going to take a look at Luke 23, 1 to 11. And Luke 23 is where Jesus has just been arrested. We know he was called to go to the cross. We know that was the will of the Father. But something interesting happened. And so I pray, God, would your Holy Spirit make these words come alive in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Luke 23, let's pick up the story. The Jews brought Jesus to the Roman governor called Pilate with charges that he, Jesus, was setting himself up as a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, is it true you're the king of the Jews? Those are your words, not mine, Jesus replied. Pilate said, I find nothing wrong with this man. But the crowd were angry against Jesus. Then, when Pilate heard Jesus came from Galilee province, he realized he came under Herod's jurisdiction. So he passed him on to Herod for questioning. Herod was delighted when Jesus arrived. You see, for a long time, he had wanted to see Jesus, hoping Jesus would do something spectacular. The priests and the Pharisees were also there accusing Jesus. So Herod kept asking Jesus questions, but Jesus didn't answer not one word. Then Herod took offense. He turned on Jesus and he started mocking and jeering at Jesus. And with his soldiers dressed him in a fake king costume and then sent him back to Pilate. <clears throat> So this version is the message version of the Bible. It's in everyday language just to help us fully understand the way we speak today. The first person we meet here is a guy called Pontius Pilate. He was the Roman governor and he asked Jesus in this trial, if you will, is it true you're king of the Jews? You see, the Jews had said that Jesus was saying, forget about Caesar, the emperor, don't pay your taxes to him. Give the money to me. I'm the real king of the Jews. He said nothing of the sort. But this is the accusation. And when Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? He's just repeating what he heard. You need to understand that this man, Pilate, according to the historians, like Josephus and others at the time, said he was one of the cruelest men you could meet. He had no problem seeing small children butchered in front of him. People died regularly. Now, I know they lived in a brutal time, but he was particularly even more brutal. So to have Pilate as your judge wasn't really a great thing. So he asks Jesus the question, and look how Jesus replies. Jesus said to Pilate, those are your words, not mine. What's that about? This is a type of silence. Jesus doesn't get into defending himself. How dare you say that? What about this? I never said that, you been, and he said, and she said, and then, and No. Jesus just put it back in Pilate. Sometimes, you and I, when someone accuses us, do you know what the worst thing we can do? The worst thing is to start defending ourselves. How about we trust someone higher than us Amen. to defend ourselves? Amen. So Jesus just puts it right back in Pilate. Really? Really, Pilate? You want me to get into this fake conversation? And so Pilate is thrown. Let's just briefly look at a verse from another account of this, which came from the Gospel of Matthew. This is what I call an unexpected voice. 
a voice that broke, if you will, the silence. Jesus didn't have to say anything, but God raised up someone else who did. I believe, I really believe, because last Wednesday morning, I, I really sensed the Holy Spirit put this on my heart to say, God is going to do this for someone here in your life. Because someone who had nothing to do with anything sent a word to Pilate. Matthew 27, 9, when Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message, have nothing to do with that innocent man. I suffered terribly in a dream today because of him. Who? Who's she? Anyone here know her name? Did she go to the meetings Jesus was at? Like you've chosen to come here today. You, did she go to the meetings? Did Jesus heal her? Was she a believer? Was she a Jew? No, 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 and uh, no. She never even met Jesus. There's no counterpart in the Bible. She makes this brief appearance for a couple of seconds and then she's gone. A totally unknown person God breaks into their life, how? Through their dreams. You think you're just asleep? Ah, the Spirit of God can speak to you when you're asleep. And he can speak to others. And I believe God is saying to someone here, I am going to break into the dreams of someone who is connected to someone in power. And they will speak on your behalf. I don't know if it's a job. If it's a health situation, education, relationship, I have no idea. But I do know this. God is saying, I am raising up a pilot's wife into your life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Out of nowhere, a nobody person. And Pilot hears this. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details, but the fact that Pilate was almost reasonable. I remember as a little boy over in Greenmount School, or just over the road here growing up, and I remember hearing the, the brother, the presentation brother, read this. And I remember going, ah, but you know, he washed his hand, he kind of couldn't do anything. I kind of had a bit of sympathy with Pilate. The thing is, the reasonable, quasi-reasonable Pilate we see was out of character. He would usually just have whoever was there slaughtered to death. But the fact that he didn't showed something was happening. Now we know that Jesus had to go to the cross so that you can, uh, and I could have new life. Would anyone say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Yeah. hallelujah means praise the Lord. That's what it means. However, God raised her up. And it's a symbol to our lives today that God can do anything. And someone you never met, you don't know, who, who's probably not even a Christian, God can break into their dreams and speak on your behalf. Hallelujah. It goes on to say that when Pilate heard that Jesus was actually from the Galilee, he realized he came under Herod's jurisdiction, so he passed them up to Herod, who happened to be in Jerusalem that day. The way the Roman Empire operated, it was one political entity. It was an empire with an emperor at the top. Now, nobody voted in the election. <laughs> Vote for Caesar. He's going to give everyone more money in their children's allowance. Yay. No, the state never gave you anything. If we get angry at our state today, just put yourself back in ancient Rome. Then you'd know what democracy was all about. Anyway, Pilate was a Roman governor appointed directly from Rome to govern what we now call Judea, the area around Jerusalem. But just north of that was another province called Galilee. And sometimes Roman provinces, everyone was under the emperor, but sometimes it was a local client king. In this case, Herod, he was local, but he had to pay the taxes and do exactly what Caesar wanted. Or sometimes you were appointed directly from Rome. Because the Jews had a temple in Jerusalem and they were kind of a difficult bunch to deal with, they wouldn't allow a local be a ruler there. They always appointed a Roman governor. And so here we have two people who were peers. They were on a level. And as soon as Pilate heard that... Uh, Herod was in town, he wanted to pass the book. And that's exactly what happened. And we're told Herod himself was delighted, delighted when Jesus arrived. For a long time he wanted to see Jesus, hoping he would do something spectacular. This guy is not a sincere searcher for truth. If you're new here, 
Can I suggest there's something very sincere about you coming in here today? You may never come here again. I don't know where your journey will go. But in this culture, you don't come to a place like this unless there's something sincere going on. This fella, he never went to a meeting. He never went to hear Jesus preach. He never went to help feeding the poor. He just wanted a bit of drama, a bit of entertainment. And it says elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus knew all men and women. He knew the motivations of their heart. And so Herod kept asking Jesus questions, but Jesus didn't answer one word. Nada. Rien. Gan fochel er be. What language is that now? How'd you say nothing in Spanish? Nada, isn't it, yeah? How'd you say it in Portuguese? Nada. Nada. What? Nada. Are they not two different languages, no? Okay. Very similar. Very similar. Okay. But he didn't answer one word. Why? How is this applicable to you? Sometimes. The best defense for your life is to say nothing. And Jesus wasn't going to play a game with this chancer. What was he thinking? He was probably thinking, you murderer. You murdered my cousin, an innocent man called John the Baptist. You pedophile. Because he really was. He was in a relationship. He had a mistress. They weren't married. And she had a daughter. History tells us she was only about 12. And her name was Salome. And her mother had her dance provocatively when this fella had a few pints and was kind of well-oiled and all his buddies with him. And he was so into this. What a weirdo. So into it. He said, I'll give you anything you want. And of course, the mother wanted the head of John the Baptist on a silver plate or platter. Why? Because he was disturbing her peace, the mother because he was calling them out. So Jesus wasn't going to play no game with this fella. Think of the most powerful man in Ireland. Now, I'm not saying anything against our beloved Taoiseach, Leo Bradker, I don't know the man at all. But sometimes, even if they're the most powerful person, you know someone even more powerful. And his name is Jesus. You and I are not dependent on a prime minister, or a president, or an employer, or a school principal, we're dependent on Jesus. He can override anything. Yeah. Doesn't mean we don't show respect. It doesn't mean we're not honest. I'm not saying that. But there's one far higher. That's right. There's one far higher. And Jesus isn't going to play that game with this guy because he knows what's motivating him. And Jesus isn't going to be, ha ha, Mr. Showman to keep him happy. No, this was too important. Jesus kept his dignity. Can I suggest you and I need to keep our dignity sometimes? And what happens? Herod took offense, he turns on Jesus, starts mocking and jeering at him, and with his soldiers, dressed him in a fake king costume. Now we've got the real guy. Initially he was, come in, come in, let me ask you questions. But this is who he really was. So Jesus wasn't going to play that game. Jesus had warned his disciples a little earlier in the Gospel of Matthew 7, 6, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls before pigs. They'll trample the pearls. And then they will turn and attack you. Keep your dignity. Keep your silence. There's a time to speak. Keep your silence. What does pearls mean? That's God's word. God's word is precious. You know, Jesus used the parable about the man who sold everything he could because there was a pearl of great price buried there. The pearl is God's word. God's word isn't just some commodity we throw. We are not sellers of a commodity. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And for those who are sincere, we are delighted to share what you want. But if people aren't interested and they've got a hard heart, you know what? God has to deal with them. Let God deal with them. Maybe they'll never want to know. On their heads be it. They'll have to stand before God like you and I will on that great and terrible day. For the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into my kingdom. And he won't say that to others. So there's a choice of heaven or hell. 
I want to choose heaven. What do you want to choose? Heaven. 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 So don't throw your pearls before pigs. They'll turn and they'll attack you. I like what the activist and author about 100 years ago, Albert Hubbard in America, said, he who does not understand your words will probably never understand your silence. With some people, you just can't win. So how about we leave them to God? Let God sort them out. If you're a teenager in secondary school, this is for you as well. It's for you in your employment situation. It's for you in your sports club. It's for you in the doctor's waiting room. It comes across every area of our lives. So Jesus wouldn't talk to the most powerful man on the earth, in his earth at that time. You see, you and I are called to live in an upside down kingdom. Look who Jesus did talk to. He had no problem talking to lepers. Lepers. Who wants to be with a leper? He wasn't concerned with the looks. You see, man is taken up with the outside. How you look on the outside. Do you think Jesus loves you more if you have a pretty face? No. Do you think he loves you more if you've got a good figure, male, female? No. Do you think he loves you more if you have a full head of hair if you're bald? No. <laughs> You get what I'm saying. Look who Jesus spoke to, for example. The blind beggar. And it says he cried out, Jesus, have mercy on me. He's a beggar. He's blind. He's the bottom of society. Straight away, does Jesus say silent? I'm not going to speak to you, you beggar. When's the last time you had a wash? And you can't even see. In that culture, if you were blind, it was seen as a curse. What can I do? Jesus replied, Lord, I want to see, he said. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. What do you mean your faith? He was just a blind beggar. He had a little bit of faith. If you have a little bit of faith, God can heal you. God can heal a broken mind. God can heal broken bodies. God can heal broken hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember, when it comes to speaking and being silent, as I start to wrap up, we don't have to try and work ourselves up. Some people find it easy to talk. A lot of people struggle with how to articulate something. And it's easy to stay silent. It's harder to talk. If you're one of the ones who doesn't struggle with silence, but you do struggle with saying something, just remember this. Luke 12, 12, if you were brought, this is Jesus, before rulers or authorities, don't worry about what to say if you have to defend yourself. The Holy Spirit will show you what you should say at that exact time. Brothers, sisters, let's rely on God when we're speaking, and let's rely on God when we're not speaking. There's a time to speak, and there's a time to remain silent. One last thing, how did these two end up? The two rulers were told. That very day, Pilate and Herod became besties. Yay! Thick as thieves. Because before that, they had always kept their distance. People who are against the faith will always gang up on those people with faith. You know what? Leave that to God. Know the leading of the Holy Spirit. When to remain silent, when to speak. So brothers and Jesus, we're going to sing a song called I Speak Jesus and it's my prayer today that we will have the wisdom and the sense of God's spirit to speak Jesus into our situation. Whether speaking Jesus is to say nothing and let God raise up someone else or whether we need to speak the words into that experience. We're going to pray in just a moment for those who want God to raise up someone like Pilate's wife in your life, if you feel that's for you, we're always going to pray generally that God will give us the wisdom to stay silent or to speak. And maybe if this is all new to you, or if this is something that you haven't touched in a long time, maybe you can connect with Jesus here and out today. And perhaps be like the word earlier, throw away the old key. Because you know what? If we don't have God in our lives, we can't make it work. You can't see the door open if we're trying that old rusty key. How about a new life in Jesus? We'll say amen.